Hi everyone, I'm Miranda and welcome to my YouTube channel. Happy Friday! My it comes mom... around quickly, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> and my mum Donna, of course, is joining me on my YouTube channel today for our regular Friday Tea Reads episode. Every Friday we get together and we bake something together and then we sit by our kitchen fire and we share some favourite short reads that we've been enjoying in the week with you all. So this is definitely a lovely start to the weekend for me and I hope it will be a great start to the weekend for you too. But anyway, would you tell us what we're baking today? We are, we're gonna, and we're gonna make a tea loaf. Yeah, a classic tea loaf. Yes, an old recipe, family recipe again. My mum made this, um, been around, and it's one that I get an awful lot of requests for when we make it. People always want the recipe, so hopefully yes. you'll enjoy this. <laughs> We've already given the recipe to our neighbour, and she's made it, and her friends wanted the recipe too. Yes. It's the type of recipe that gets passed around a lot. It's a good one because it's really easy, and very it's very simple. frugal, actually, It is. It's it? good for this time of year, when you've got a lot of expenses coming up, making Christmas cakes, Christmas puddings, Christmas presents you're going to yeah. be buying, so it's a good one for that. And it's good for lockdown because you don't mm. need a lot of ingredients, so mm. we started making this quite a bit again last March, didn't we? We did. Um, so would you tell us what we need for it? Yes, yeah, so it's very simple, it's a cup of things. So you have a cup of um, brown sugar and a cup of all bran, just the old fashioned simple all bran. And then a cup of mixed fruit. Mm -hmm. and that all goes into one bowl. Just give it a stir. And then you're going to add to it a cup of cold tea or skim milk. You can use either. I've got cold tea today. Just when you've made a cup of tea, just take that tea bag, put another cup of water in, and leave it to sit until you get a nice sort of strong brew and then you're going to soak the all bran, the brown sugar and the raisin as a mixed um, mixed brew yeah. all together and leave it for about one hour and this will make the all bran kind of disappear. It looks like um, threads, doesn't it, right yes, now? Yes, it does. Yeah. By the time you've left it an hour, an hour and a quarter, really there won't be any threads at all. It just ends up looking, and that's the one I made Yes, having another uh, yeah. Joe Peter moment yeah, this yeah. week. We thought we'd show you what it looks like after an hour's soaking. So I'll bring it over. You can have a look. You can see that the all brown has pretty much disappeared. It has. And then to this one, we just yeah. then add a cup of self-raising flour mm -hmm. in which you've um, mixed just a, a, a teaspoon of mixed spice. If you haven't got mixed spice, you can use cinnamon and nutmeg together or whatever you've got really, but I like the mixed spice. Yeah. So just stir the flour and the mixed spice together, pop it all in. Wonderful. This really is such an easy recipe. It is brilliant. It it's doesn't great take one, isn't it? butter, doesn't take eggs. No, people always say, oh, you've forgotten the egg. And mm. it's like, no, there, there is no egg in this one. Yeah. I mean, you do have to put, people say, oh, it must be really um, diety. And it isn't. <laughs> we actually like it with butter on the top. <laughs> and there is sugar in it. So I think there is some sugar yes, in it. But it's yes. probably not one of the naughtiest cakes. No, because there's no have, icing or anything There's like no that. icing. And I mean, there really isn't any fat no, in it. No, there isn't. Is there? There it's isn't. quite an extraordinary cake in some way. It is. And, and it, it just is, it's nice, isn't it? You like it a lot. I do like it a lot. It is really good to serve it with butter. And that's what we do. And yeah. we generally have it for a simple afternoon tea. If a friend is coming over and you need to pull something together that's quite simple, then we might make this in the morning. It's nothing really fancy, but it's always tasty. We're always asked for the recipe for this, yeah. aren't we? Yeah. And yeah, it's just a great sort of standby recipe to have in your back pocket, so to speak. I think it is, it's just really good for that. And it's one that I know when you were at university, when you finally mm. did get 
an oven. <laughs> Lived a long one. time without one. <laughs> yeah, but this was one that you really liked having. Yes, I mean, you can see how easy it is and easy yeah. to remember that it's really just a cup of everything. A cup of everything and a teaspoon of the mixed spice. Yes. So it's really, it's really easy. Really easy. <laughs> and then you, yeah. I've already, already re greased and lined side. the bottom. Yeah. A normal loaf tin. Yeah. And then in it goes. And this is going to cook about 45 minutes. Um, I always check it about 35 minutes and keep my eye on it because our oven's quite hot. And then um, you just pop it in. When it's finished, you need to leave it in the tin for a while. And then basically then all you're doing is letting it cool, turn it out when it's cool, and then you can slice it. Yeah, so you let it cool in the tin completely. You can. I mean, I usually, I must admit, I'm always nervous of that. I tend to run a knife around, leave it 10 minutes in the tin, then I turn it out. Okay. I think my mum didn't do that. She let it cool in the tin. So no. your confidence. <laughs> I'm always scared the thing's going to stick. Yeah, me too. <laughs> we do tend to turn things out. Yeah, quickly. yeah. Unless it's something you really can't. Yeah. This one you can. Give it sort of 10 minutes and then whip it out, I would say. Yes. If, if you run a knife around, then it's normally no problem. Brilliant. That's it. It's ready to go in the oven. Well, nice and easy. I'm yeah. going to pop this in the oven now and we'll see you again later when hopefully we'll be having a slice. Yes, lovely. See you then. See you then. And we're back again. Hello. <laughs> it's come out of the oven. Yeah. It smells wonderful. Here, let me show you. Hopefully you can see that. It does smell good, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. We've cheated a bit, still a bit warm. It's still a little bit warm, but we wanted to get on with recording. Yes. So <laughs> you've had such a busy week. It's yes. Been, we've been half in November and half in Christmas festivities this week. Yes, we have, because I'm trying to film some Christmas content ahead of time. Well, not even ahead of time, but just starting <laughs> a bit early. And, <laughs> Uh, it's been very busy, but also lovely. It's been lovely. Yes. It really has. And we've started with a few festive touches. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, I think the, the living room's gone full Christmassy almost by this point. Oh, well, don't think too okay. much yet. Yeah. Yeah. Surprise to come. Okay, shut, shut. <laughs> yeah, so we've got the fire blazing, mm. which is lovely. Let's try our cake. Okay. You've already buttered it very efficiently, which yes, is I, very nice. Yeah. Got a little bit to try. Mm -hmm. mm. It's slightly chewy, isn't it? Mm hmm But mm. you know, when it's still a bit it, warm and the butter's just melted on it. Now you have to put it in malt loaf and there's no actual malt oh, in it. Yes. But I know what she means, that sort of slightly chewy, squidgy texture. Yes, it is it's nice. very squidgy. Mm. It's delicious, mm. it really is. Mm. Mm. Wash oh, down with a cup of tea, just perfect. <laughs> mm. And I've got another whole one for the freezer because we ended up making <laughs> the two in the end. So yes, that's perfect if anybody drops by unexpectedly next week, we've still got one. Yes, well, because, I mean, we're not having people over right now, but no. people still turn up. We've got someone, I think, who's going to be bringing us some kindling. Yeah, very so, kindly. So yes, like, maybe some more apples, you know, because yes. I haven't made enough <laughs> apple butter, obviously. Yeah. So at least we've got the way to sort of pass out the door yeah. in return, yeah. which is yeah. really good. Yeah. Well, we've got a real stack today, we do. don't we? We do, and I, we don't always know what the other's going to choose, so I'm very no, interested. No, we haven't been so organised this week no. and, and told each other. No. <laughs> but um, I think you'll like my choices. Oh, I know I will. Of course, it was Remembrance Day this yes. week. It was Remembrance Sunday, and then Remember Remembrance Day actually on Wednesday, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yes. So I thought I'd share some poems, exactly. especially appropriate to that this week. And actually, I wanted to start with this one because it's one of my favourite poems. And I want to start with this one because I have to just not cry reading this. It's a really moving poem and I just have to... 
hopefully just so I read know, it. I know which one she's going to read. I won't cry either, will I? Yes. Um, I read Testament Abused as a young woman by Vera Britton, and it's her autobiography of her life greatly affected by the First World War. And as well as an amazing writer, Vera Britton was also a fantastic poet. She wrote some beautiful poems and she wrote a very moving poem on learning of the death of her fiancé, Roland Layton. And I wanted to read this poem because it was one of the first poems I think that truly brought home some of the real tragedy of World War One to me so. as a teenager. Yes. You know, when I first yes. started reading some of the poetry. I can understand. Of that, that time. Okay, I admit we're actually on the third take of me trying to read this poem without we crying both now. Being crying, yes, so we're so gonna try. I'm going to really try because, oh dear. So perhaps to RAL. Perhaps some day the sun will shine again, and I shall see that still the skies are blue, and feel once more I do not live in vain, although bereft of you. Perhaps the golden meadows at my feet will make the sunny hours of spring seem gay, and I shall find the white may blossom sweet, though you have passed away. Perhaps the summer woods will shimmer bright, and crimson roses once again be fair. And autumn harvest fields a rich delight, although you were not there. But though kind time may many joys renew, there is one greatest joy I shall not know again, because my loss, because my heart for loss of you was broken long ago. <laughs> It's very good. You got through it. Got through it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, it's because it's because I always seem to end up. It's because it's a brilliant very emotional. Poem. It's a brilliant it poem, is. and it made such a big impact on me the first time I read it, and still does. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Just imagine the bawling wreck I was the first time I read it. Oh, I mean, it, but it's just such a moving poem. It isn't is. It? I think it speaks. And the way she she goes through each of the seasons, describing yes. the joys of each yeah. season, and in the yeah. end, yes. Yeah, and I think you know, for anyone who's lost anyone, yeah, yeah. um, this poem speaks to you and. It's just, it speaks not only to those who served their country and died, but also those who were left behind. Right. So yeah. many, so many women, yeah. especially yeah. from the First World War, that she must have been really articulating a sentiment that so many women of that time felt. Yes, mm. yes, exactly, she did. Um, but yes, it's one of my favourite poems, even though I cry when I read it. But you did very well. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Third, third take. <laughs> yeah. Never mind. It's, yeah. it's real. Yeah. Well, and then I wanted to also share a poem from this amazing anthology called The Magic oh, Hour. Wonderful. By Charlotte Moore. Brenda gave this to me. And yes. It was a wonderful present. <laughs> I thought you would like it and I was so happy that she did. Mm. And I love it too. The idea behind this book is so lovely. It was first started as well, Charlotte Moore started a Tuesday Poetry Club Society where friends, I think, of hers would gather by her fireside and they choose a poem and talk about it each week. And some of those poems are collected in this volume. Yeah. And a lot of the poems come under quite interesting headings, but one of the headings is on war. Yeah. And there is some... Um, amazing poems about World War One and more generally about war and about loss. Yeah. And I wanted to share this one by Siegfried Sassoon, who was a man who did come back did, but... from fighting, but he yeah. he still lost so much yes. from that experience. Was scarred terribly really. Exactly. Not physically. Still yeah. still damaged yeah. from it. 
And this was a poem he wrote called Falling Asleep. Voices moving about in the quiet house, thud of feet and a muffled shutting of doors, everyone yawning. Only the clocks are alert. Out in the night there's autumn smelling gloom, crowded with whispering trees. Across the park, a hollow cry of hounds like lonely bells. And I know that the clouds are moving across the moon, the low red rising moon. Now herons call and wrangle by their pool, and hooting owls sail from the wood above pale stooks of oats. Waiting for sleep, I drift from thoughts like these, and where today was dreamlike, build my dreams. Music, there was a bright white room below, and someone singing a song about a soldier, one hour, two hours ago, and soon the song will be last night, but now the beauty swings across my brain, ghost of remembered chords, which still can make such radiance in my dream, that I can watch the marching of my soldiers and count their faces, faces, sunlit faces, falling asleep, the herons and the hounds. September in the darkness, and the world I've known all fading past me into peace. And what I really like about this book is that Charlotte Moore writes a little bit about the poem oh, after each one. Share. And she says, Sassoon's heroism, both as a soldier and as an opponent of the way the First World War was conducted, are extremely well known, as is his bitter and compromising war poetry. This poem, written ten months after the armistice, shows him processing the knowledge that the fighting is over and that he can return to something resembling a peaceful life. The beloved Kentish landscape of his youth is still there. Time passes and makes repairs. He can dare to think of the men he commanded, not as corpses in waiting, but as men with sunlit faces, men who can be transformed and immortalised in a beautiful song. I'm glad he wrote this, said Polly. He deserved it. Polly must have been one of the members yes. of the poetry group. But I loved that poem and I love this anthology. Yes. I really want to recommend, recommend it. this yeah. and highlight it. It's beautiful. It is. And that's a lovely poem, not one of his most famous ones. No. But I love I it. I loved it. that too. Yeah. And it's autumnal setting as yeah. well. Yeah. Felt very appropriate. Um, so much of World War One poetry is... Oh, you know, it, and I think you know my my mother lost an uncle in World War One. She lost her first husband in World War Two. I was very much brought up with lest we forget and yeah. our sense of it. So I think it's it's a wonderful time to look back through the poetry, which grabs you, it doesn't it? And it really does. Yeah, it. it does. But then after those, I did also want to choose something. A little lighter, okay. But that also spoke to this time of year, because, <laughs> as you know, we're experiencing quite a few creepy crawlies <laughs> coming into the wall. Yeah. I had you remove a very large spider just yesterday evening. She did. I had a little. It's <laughs> not very good with spiders. I'm not terrible, but uh, she's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> You're a lot braver than I am. So you came and removed it outdoors. Yes, yes. Um, but I wanted to share something that will make spider haters perhaps like them a bit more. Okay. Um, this extract from A Claxton Diary by Mark Cocker. I love his nature writing, and this is his nature diary. And there's an extract dated 11th November 2013 mm. that I wanted to share. If ever a spider could soften the knee-jerk reactions of the average arachnophobe, then I suspect it would be the marbled orb weaver. The one I stumbled across was about as captivating as they get. The whole of its body was a rich, almost edible, buttery yellow that resembled that glorious sun-coloured inner corolla to a primrose flower. Yet this only half captures 
the full appeal of this particular species. Because across the hind part of its abdomen, the marbled orb weaver possesses a leaf-like pattern of contrasting shade. In many, it is a deep mahogany brown, but on this female, it was the exact tone of an old oak leaf, caught in winter sunlight. It also had a fretted quality, like a window shutter carved out in ornate Arabic calligraphy. In truth, the whole beast conjured for me something decidedly Islamic. As well as the primrose and the oak, its colours evoked nothing so much as those fabulous silk soft babouche slippers that are arranged in exquisite rows to tempt passers by in the labyrinth markets of Marrakesh. Oh, that is lovely. Is that after his book called Claxton? Yes, his first book is Claxton. Yeah. And this is the second one that's come out. But I loved all those, oh, the colours. The detail. That he yeah. The tiny detail. Of yes, the and the metaphors of everything. And yes, the comparisons. Exactly. It's lovely. I must say, the one last night, I didn't notice any beautiful colours. <laughs> no, it was, it was a great big out. black. <laughs> <laughs> it was enormous. It was. Yeah. So you, you weren't looking at it too close. No, I sort of just gently yes. got it up and got it out. Yeah, yeah. Thank oh, goodness, yes. But anyway, <laughs> I'll try to like them a bit more. Uh, what choices do you have for us? Um, I have a poem too, so maybe I'll start with that one. Oh, yes. And this one, this book, which is called The Golden Treasury of Poetry, selected and with a commentary by um, Louis Antemeyer, was a childhood one for me. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have my original mm. volume. When Miranda was born, I was so sorry not to have it, so I ran out and bought another copy, which again isn't this one. That one's probably in Long Island, yes. as your dad has got so many of your books. Yes. But when we moved to the UK, I just happened to see it in a charity shop and I <laughs> swooped in and got it. And I'm so glad I did because... It's a lovely collection. It is, isn't it? And unlike you, I decided, because um, I thought I'd cry if I did too much about about <laughs> well, Armistice Day, that's but that's I, I, um, I went for... Um, this one's quite comic, this poem, and it's about um, rem that Remembrance Day is also um, Martin's Mass. It's it's St. Martin's Day in the old yes, yes, calendar. That's right. So this was a sort of comic poem that I loved when I was young, and it's called Get Up and Bar the Door. And nobody knows who wrote it. It's that old. It's sort of a um, ballad. Yes. yes. It fell about the Martinmas time, and a gay time it was then, when our good wife got puddings to make, and she spoiled them in the pan. The wind so cold blew south and north and blew into the floor. Quoth our good man to our good wife, get up and bar the door. My hand is in my household work, good man as he may see. And it will not be barred for a hundred years if it's to be barred by me. They made a pact between them both. They made it firm and sure that whosoever should speak the first should rise and bar the door. Then by there came two gentlemen at twelve o'clock at night, and they could see neither house nor hall, nor coal nor candlelight. Now, whether this is a rich man's house or whether it is poor, but never a word would one of them speak for barring up the door. The guests, they ate the white puddings, and then they ate the black, though much the good wife thought to herself, yet never a word she spoke. Then one, said one stranger to the other, Here, man, take ye my knife. Do we take off the old man's beard? and I'll kiss the good wife. There's no hot water to scrape it off, and what shall we do then? Then why not use the pudding broth that boils into the pan? Oh, up then started our good man, an angry man was he. Will he kiss my wife before my eyes, and with pudding broth scold me? Then up and started our good wife, gave three skips on the floor. Good man, you've spoken the very first word. Get up and bar 
the door. <laughs> I've always her. loved that poem. I think just the white pudding and black, black pudding. <laughs> and I think just the way that even all those years ago that this was originally put together, the stubbornness of, you know, this old man, old woman, each was determined not to be the first one to speak. It just took my fancy but as a child, but I still quite love that one. That is really fun. And it's one of the few poems I think about St. Martimus. There's probably a couple more, but that's the one I always think of. Yes, so oh, I'm yeah, so glad that you chose that. And I love those old calendar dates that are often forgotten. They now. are, they are. That's true. Nice I mean, to be reminded of them. It is nice, and you think these things too that we often don't, um, well, we don't celebrate anymore. But um, you know, I imagine since England became um, Protestant rather than Catholic, the mm. saint days have been falling into not yes. celebration so yes. much outside of the Catholic Church. But for my second one today, I decided to read a piece of Thomas Hardy's from The Woodlanders because um, this time of year we've been doing a bit of planting outside. Well, at least our, our friend has been helping us by doing a bit of planting. <laughs> You're more accurate. Yes. yes. <laughs> Um, but this, I, I do remember that my dad always said that this time of year was very good to actually plant trees. Mm. So this is a bit about tree planting. Yeah, the holes were already dug and they set to work. Winterborne's fingers were endowed with a gentle conjurer's touch in spreading the roots of each little tree, resulting in a sort of caress under which the delicate fibres all laid themselves out in their proper directions for growth. He put most of these roots towards the southwest. For, he said, in 40 years' time, when some great gale is blowing from that quarter, the trees will require the strongest hold fast on that side to stand against it and not fall. How they sigh directly we put them aright, though while they are lying down they don't sigh at all, said Marty. Do they, said Giles? I've never noticed it. She erected one of the young pines into its hole and held up her finger. The soft musical breathing instantly set in, which was not to cease night or day till the grown tree should be felled, probably long after the two planters had been felled themselves. It seems to me, the girl continued, as if they sigh because they are sorry to begin life in earnest, just as we be. Mm. That's a lovely little extract. I love that. It's quite special. I, I love the Woodlanders. It's, it's mm. an interesting one. Um, and I just think that sort of way he describes the pine trees and that, that sigh and then the musical note that you hear always from these trees yes, is wonderful. So true. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love Hardy. I love his yeah. descriptions of nature. Always. And there's something I think about this time of year that, you know, as somebody who's from Dorset, it really brings a lot of Hardy to my mm. mind. Yes. Yeah. That was wonderful. And then I've got a final one. Yes. And this, I mentioned this book, I think, back when you were still doing Teen Tunnel Podcast in yes. Easter. Yes. And I recommended this book, which is by Jeffrey Snag, Letters from Long Stock. And it's a forward by Miss Reed, which is how I first learned about it. It's a beautiful book. I mean, isn't that pretty? It is. I love the cover. Yes. 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 And it's just little um, letters, but extracts, really, that he sends out um, through the year. So this one's called... Primulas and Rolls Royces. However, the bit that I want to um, actually read is about another pesky thing that's been coming through to, to our house. And that's like, we've had wasps, but this is um, about this time of year having an influx of bees. Oh. We have lately had a number of bees rather sleepily buzzing about the house, especially in the evenings. At first I thought they were drones who had been kicked out of the hives before winter set in to save food and was not unduly frightened, but soon discovered that they were ordinary bees who not only sting, but presumably can decide to re reconnoitre the house with the idea of finding a suitable building site for the future. A friend in Ireland had some bees build under her bedroom floor and had the devil's own job of getting rid not only of the bees, 
but also the wasps that came in after the honey that started oozing down the wall of the drawing room <laughs> below. <laughs> she had eventually to evacuate both rooms while the floors and ceilings were ripped up in order to deal with them. That was several years ago. She wrote this summer to say that the bees were back again and one of them had stung her dog for no reason at all when he was asleep in his basket <laughs> in her bedroom and she was very annoyed about it. Even though we have not got a dog, we were determined to discourage them and have had quite a few energetic evenings driving them out with rolled up newspapers and all things considered with very little damage. Except when we thought we could drive them out more quickly if we were to put out the, the light round which they always seem to gather when slashed at. <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> what a nightmare. Yes, we have had some wasps coming in but yes. I don't know what happened that you talked about can't get over the image of like honey <laughs> dripping, dripping down, down. <laughs> basically obviously they did actually start yes their, their nest in there I guess imagine that I mean it's quite a scary thought isn't yes, it yes Jenny they move them outside please <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hopefully, we won't have problems quite on that scale. Yeah. Well, those were my choices. They were wonderful. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. And I thoroughly enjoyed this. The fire's died down a bit, so I think we're going to pick it up. Yeah. Or another, make another pot of tea. Yes, yeah, so it's probably had it now. Yeah. <laughs> and continue our Friday afternoon. But I hope that you enjoyed this. Thank you so much for watching. Do give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and you can subscribe to my channel by clicking on my face that pops up on the screen over there. And I hope you will have a wonderful weekend ahead of you. Now I must say that next week things will be a little bit different yes. because next Friday is the 20th and we always do our book club of the month discussion on the 20th. So next Friday will be a book club episode, not a tea reads episode. However, on next Sunday, we are going to do a special yes. tea reads um, for Stir Up Sunday. Exactly. So join us for Stir Up Sunday next Sunday yeah. and we'll be hopefully sharing some nice extracts that are appropriate for them too. Yeah. So yes, next week things are a little bit different, but hopefully you'll still really enjoy it. You'll still be seeing us. <laughs> yes. Twice me next week. Oh, <laughs> they're in for a treat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Happy weekend. Bye-bye.